Shares for Beginners. My day to day is dealing with people at the front office of ETFs mm-hmm. and trying to find what their problems are so that I can resolve it. And I think data insights is, is a key aspect in that, really, because data doesn't lie. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. How are ETFs created and what is an issuer? What's all the paperwork you receive when you first buy a share or ETF? How do ETF providers know if their ETFs are actually fulfilling the needs of investors? To explain all this and more is Ibrahim Hussain. G'day, Ibrahim. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming along early on a Monday morning. Thank you so much. I actually love your work. I've listened to a few of your uh, podcasts. So oh, fantastic. It's an Thank absolute you. pleasure being here. Thank you. Ibrahim is the General Manager of ETFs at ComputerShare. He has over 15 years of experience in assisting ETF issuers meet their strategic objectives and build solid relationships with their investors. So tell us about how you became interested in finance in the first place. What were you doing, you know, at uh, a young age? What sort of age did you get into it? (laughs) Okay, I'm not going to give away my age, but (laughs) if I have to describe myself, I would describe myself as a front office guy who loves finance. Mm. Uh, my love for finance goes back at a very young age at school. And what attracted me to the concept of finance is the concept of wealth and value creation. So that pathway took me to university where I studied uh, economic banking and finance. Mm. And subsequently, I did uh, an MBA in finance and strategic management. When I was at university, my goal was to actually get into investment banking. That's, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. But then I got sidetracked into the financial markets. You know, like everyone else, I always thought that shares and share trading was luck of the draw. You pick stocks here and there, you get lucky sometimes, sometimes you get unlucky. Then I realized there's actually art and science in investment. And that really is what got me to it. But today, really, the aspect that I love, I love the most about my, my, my role is dealing with people. Mm. Uh, I love dealing with people. I love dealing with decision makers in finance. I love dealing with people behind decision makers. I like dealing with people at the call face and everyone in between. I'm a firm believer of networking. I'm a firm believer that every person that you meet has a potential to add value to your life. Kiss in point, yourself, Phil. We have met in we met in a a party. That's at right. A party. <laughs> Not a party. It was a networking event, an ETF networking event, and here we are having a cup of coffee and talking about ETFs. Yeah, well, that dance music was pretty loud, so <laughs> that party yes. in the background. But, but I was, party yeah, to me. there you go. So, did you? Um, when did you first start investing yourself? Uh, look, I w- what we did at university. I mean, were you doing it like in that luck of the draw idea? You sort what? of go, oh yeah, I'll pick that one and buy that stock or at university we we played the asx game mm. where they give you fake money and you invest in real stocks yeah uh, i think this game is still still on play today it's yeah it is i think yeah. years <laughs> later. it was part of our assignment so we were asked to actually invest for a period of uh, three months mm-hmm. and use the tools that we were taught at school to do that so i did that i didn't really do very well <laughs> <laughs> mainly because of market conditions yeah. at the time it kind of gave me the idea oh actually let me just try, throw a few dollars here and there. Obviously, I was a student. I didn't have a lot of money, yeah. spare money to invest in. But then I put a bit of money into the stock market using the tools that I had studied at the time. And then I started seeing the results at the time. So I thought of, this is, this is a beautiful thing. Mm. So going back to what I said earlier, the concept of wealth creation and value creation, I started seeing those outcomes, albeit at a kind of micro level. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is not a bad thing. I've got yet, you know, kids under three kids under seven, and I'm trying to kind of teach them that concept of this early. It's never too early. Do they uh, listen? They all they want is pocket money to go and buy a lollipop. So <laughs> at this stage, so, <laughs> you're not sort of uh, saying, okay, uh, you've got to save some of these. Yeah, so they, you know, they've got piggy banks, banks yeah. obviously, and and they understand the concept of saving, mm. but also I'm trying to teach them the concept of not just saving, but actually making that money work for you. When did you be first become aware of ETFs? Because they're, they're quite a new thing in Australia, really, relatively new. Relatively. Uh, we are late adopters in Australia compared mm-hmm. to other markets. I was involved in 2007 when mm. Barclays Global Investors introduced their iShares cross-listed ETFs. Mm-hmm. I was I think one of the first cross-listed ETFs in Australia, 
primarily domiciled in the US and, and secondary listed here in Australia. It was a very new concept. And I was lucky enough at the time to be involved in that launch project. And that's really was kind of my initiation into the world of all, of ETFs. So I've seen the industry evolve over time mm. uh, to where it is now. So you work at ComputerShare now. What is ComputerShare and how does it touch every investor? <laughs> oh, a great question. Uh, ComputerShare. I've got to ask you a question. Do you know, do you know that ComputerShare was uh, one of the first fintechs in Australia? Uh, I think Scott may have uh, mentioned you may have you may have let, you know that in that <laughs> secret. He might yes. have mentioned something, something about that. <laughs> yeah. But, so yeah. you know, t- computer share is just an incredible Aussie success story. You know, mm. you know, it started from a very humble beginnings. 1978 in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, 1994, we got listed uh, on, on the ASX, and the market capitalization at that point was 36 million Australian dollars. As a close of market last Friday. The market cap was sitting at around sixteen point four billion dollars. With a B. <laughs> Today, mm-hmm. uh, we have offices in over twenty-one countries, employing about sixteen thousand people, looking after seventy-five million account holders around the world. Mm. What we do, in a nutshell, we attract, engage, and manage our client stakeholders. Those stakeholders could be in the listed space as shareholders or outside of that. Mm. That's effectively what we do around the world. That's one of the things, one of the main things is being a share registry. So Mm -hmm. when you first purchase a share or an ETF or Mm -hmm. anything listed on the stock market, Mm -hmm. um, Computer Share and a couple of other companies, but we won't talk about them. (laughs) um, Computer Share is what's known as a share registry. What is a share registry? And tell us about that. Yeah, so a share registry, as the name implies, is really involved in managing the share registry. Uh, for a company. Mm. So we would, in the example that you provided for a listed company, once an investor has bought shares through the broker, the information are passed on to us, right? And then our role from then on is to manage that relationship with that investor and any other change of ownership as investors buy and sell those securities. Once we have the records, then what we do is we would undertake any activity or corporate events on behalf of of the of the issuer so if an issuer say pays a dividend Mm. or issues the reinvestment plan we would do that on behalf of the issuer corporate actions bonus payments share locations all those things we do all that and any subsequent communication as well issuance of statements to investors we'll do that on behalf of the issuer the key kind of aspect in this relationship is that we are the conduit between the companies that are in this example that are listed and Mm. the investors. Yeah. Because it's very confusing for a new investor. As soon as they buy their first listed um, investment, they're going to be getting a number of um, pieces of paperwork. And it's from the share registry. uh, It's from their broker. Mm. And um, obviously their chest statements as well. Overall, can you explain that um, process and um, why it's not as daunting as it might um, seem in the first place? Yeah, it's not daunting and it shouldn't. So when you first purchase a share of the broker, there's a process there, which includes your contract note, etc. Mm. Then your details are registered with the broker, right? Whilst I've said earlier that the holding information is passed on to us, more often than not, the information that we need for us to manage that account are not passed on to us at that point which is why computer share then undertakes an onboarding process. This onboarding process can be done electronically if we already have an email address for that investor. Mm. But if it's a brand new investor, then unfortunately we have to initially go out via what we call a welcome paper, where in that welcome paper, we will ask investors to go to our website and provide information that help us to maintain that relationship. So what we would typically do is ask for an email address Mm-hmm. banking details, tax file number, and also for ETFs, we would ask them to certify for FATCA and CRS, which these are, are tax certifications. So they're foreign tax certifications, and I'll explain. So the Australian government has entered into multilateral agreement with other foreign countries or tax offices to exchange information. Mm. So that information requires investors in every country to certify where their tax residency is at. Mm. So for ETFs, we would normally ask uh, investors to certify 
whether they are Australian or not. And that's very important for listeners because if you don't do that, then we would actually pass on that information to the ATO. But if you miss that initial onboarding, we would normally send two other reminders during the year. So don't mm. panic if you've missed any the initial call to action there. Mm. So really, the idea is that onboarding process is intended to make sure that it dictates the relationship ongoing. So if an investor doesn't provide the email address, then all, all future communications are done via paper. So let's talk about ETFs. What's your definition of an ETF? I mean, we've covered this so many times on the podcast, but I always like to hear everyone's little nuanced um, view of what their definition of an ETF is. Look, uh, ETFs are very simple products. And and as you know, ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. And as the term implies, these are funds that are traded on on the stock market. Mm. So they have the same characteristics like any other stock. They can be bought and sold through your broker, right? But what they provide that are different to normal stocks is that by buying an ETF, a single ETF, generally speaking, will give you an exposure to a basket of securities, which can be shares, could be commodities, could be fixed income, could be currency, fiat or digital, or any other asset class. Mm. The benefit that has for an investor is that it first and foremost reduces transaction costs, right? So if you had to go and buy individual stocks, there are transaction costs associated with that, brokerage fees, etc. By buying an ETF that gives you an exposure of a you know a basket of shares takes away most of that cost. And also most of the ETFs, depending on the type of the ETF, most of the ETFs actually have uh, very low fees. So the management fees are very low. Like to give you an example, if you purchase an ETF that has a management fee of 10 basis points, you invest $10,000, your annual fee is $10, mm. right? Pretty low. And, and really the benefits there is also the, the, the diversification benefits from that because using an index ETF as an example, if you look at any particular index, depending on the type of the index, you know, the diversification in terms of, of sectors and industry is quite wide. Mm. And also... You have to bear in mind that ETFs are issued by professional fund managers, right? So they've done the research. So you don't have to rely on your own undertaking to invest uh, you know, on, on single stocks. So you're mitigating a lot of risk through that diversification as well. So the benefits are pretty diverse. And the other kind of key benefit in ETF that most people don't know is the liquidity of ETFs. ETFs have multiple layers of liquidity. So a fund manager... An ETF issuer would typically appoint a market maker or market makers, multiple. One of the roles among many of the market maker is to provide liquidity. So if you look at a single stock as an example, the liquidity of that particular stock is limited to shares on issue because Mm. most companies are closed-ended securities, right? The shares on market are what they are. There's no more. There's no more created. There's just a certain number. And if the volumes are low, there's no liquidity. It's hard to buy and sell, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, With ETFs, they're open-ended. So one of the roles of the market maker, at the end of the trading day, they'll do the netting. If there are more buyers than there are sellers, then they'll go and create additional inventory. So they'll place an order in. That order will flow through to the likes of ComputerShare if you are managing that ETF. Mm. And then ComputerShare will issue those new securities to market within a day or two. The benefit of that to ETF investors is that at any given time, no matter what market conditions are, no matter how low the trading volumes on the screen look like, Mm -hmm. you'll always be able to buy and sell ETFs. And that's during the day. It's like that, isn't it? Like uh, when you go to buy or sell an ETF on market, you're going to be getting almost exactly what the asset value of the securities behind it um, is at that particular moment. Yeah. So the, the, ETFs are tracking an index mm-hmm. or they're tracking an underlying, no, mm-hmm. not just an index, they're trying an underlying, you know, uh, basket of securities, which could be securities or commodities, as I said earlier. And the idea for an ETF is for the ETF price to really track the net asset value price of the mm. underlying very closely. And one of the roles of the market makers is to make sure through the spreads that the ETF price is tracking as close as possible to the net price. It can be confusing for new investors to come into the market because they see there's so many types of ETFs. Can you just give us a quick rundown on those? Yeah, look, I think um, the first point I'd like to make is is really to your listeners, everyone needs to actually understand their own situation Mm -hmm. in terms of their 
you know, investment objectives and goals and risk profiles and so on. And time so, horizon yep. as well. So yep. just, everyone needs to go and seek their own advice. So mm-hmm. what I'm going to say by no means qualifies as advice because I'm not a qualified advisor. I think we are very lucky in Australia that given we are late adopters of the ETFs, there's quite a lot of choices on the market today and mm-hmm. credit to fund managers who have been very innovative in coming up with products and regulators as well who have been very keen to actually um, you know facilitate facilitate move, yeah. the issuance of this mm. product so ETFs there are different types of ETFs I think it's important that we talk about them right so traditionally ETFs you know are associated with passive ETFs right mm-hmm. so what that means is the ETFs are passively managed by the fund manager they're not actively managed right so they'll be benchmarked of an index right mm-hmm. that index could be um, you know the top 200 stocks. Top 200 uh, based on capital ca- yeah. uh, market capitalization, mm-hmm. right? Or it could be sector-related index, mm-hmm. right? But they're passive. And because they're passive ETFs, normally they have lower costs. And, and passive just means that there's the fund manager is not so saying, oh, this particular stock is going to do better than another stock. Yeah, they're not picking any stock. And the characteristic mm. of a pa- the main characteristic of a passive ETF is that the, the ETF is not intended to beat the market. Mm. So it's benchmarked to the market. So the performance of the ETF should more or less equal the performance of the underlying benchmark that it's, mm. it's tracking, mm. right? So that, that's the main rationale for that. Yep. Active ETFs, on the other hand, as the term implies, they're actively managed by the fund manager who, as you've alluded, pick the underlying stock. And the rationale is they intend to outperform the market. So mm. the fees are usually a bit higher there. So that's the kind of the fundamental difference between a passive and active ETF. And then in between you've got, you may have heard about smart beta ETFs or factor ETFs. So these are kind of halfway housed between the two. Mm. And they're usually offered by passive fund managers where they will use an index as an example, but instead in, in terms of just letting the index follow the, the weighting of the market capitalization, what they would do is they will use rules based or factors. So they may just take all the weightings out of capital or market capitalization and use factors mm. to make sure they kind of rearrange the, the, the components of the index. And the idea is to make sure that is to kind of outperform the, the index, right? Yep. And the benefit you get with that is that it's still managed by a passive fund manager. So you get all the benefits of passive managers such as low fees, etc. Yeah, and also you've got you know thematic ETFs. Yeah, thematic ETFs. I mean, they've really become popular, haven't yeah. they? And they're 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 trying to um, address particular investment aims and goals of investors, aren't they? The thematic ETFs are appealing to people's conscience, right? And also, it's targeting mega trends or trends that are coming. So, if there is a trend that you know, issues think will continue to grow, then, you know, they may build an ETF through that theme, but also through beliefs as well. Like we've seen in, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, there have been a lot of uh, ETFs that are targeting religious beliefs as well. Mm. You know, there's as a Catholic value ETF, as example. In the, we've seen the first Islamic ETF issued in Australia um, about a month or so ago. And, you know... Really? I didn't... I yeah. haven't heard about this. What, yeah, what's that yeah. one? I think it's ISLM is the, the ticker, if I'm not wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's really kind of appealing to the conscious people's beliefs. Yeah. And, and picking, you know, the underlying that are aligned with people's beliefs. And, you know, I've seen a lot of ethic. I mean, these are kind of in the ethical kind of. No, I understand that. I just well. haven't heard about religious based ones. Yeah. Like, and you mentioned the Catholic ETF. In the and, US, yeah. yeah. So in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, there have been quite a few um, mm-hmm. ETFs. The thematic ETFs are intended yeah. to do that as well. So, mm. you know, looking at trends and technologies, climate change, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of uh, ESG kind of themed ETFs as well that we, we start to see in the market. So it's, it's the way of the future and it's part of innovation that ETF issuers constantly churn, you know. So, you know, the, the possibilities for ETFs is, is limitless. And I think kind of to round up your question is there's an ETF for everyone, right? Right. So if whether your aim is growth, passive income, or whatever, there's, there's an ETF for everybody. Mm. Um, and you just need to do your homework, seek advice. I think that's a, a rational thing to do. And yeah. 
I think it's also important to always consider the different types of ETFs in terms of uh, some ETFs, and you alluded previously to this, is some are about income. And yeah. you can invest in ETFs that are just set up for income purposes yeah. only, which is not, that's the debt markets, isn't it? That's Yeah. Um, it's not to do with stock markets. You're going to be earning income from debt markets. And, and that's a good point, because if you look at ETFs, like I, I'll look at the asset classes on offer today, right? So fixed income are relatively new, right? Mm. So they came into market, I think it was around 2010. I could be wrong, but, you know, in, in, that, in that region. And really... The idea was really to give investors access to the debt market because it's not easy to invest in debt market. So through an ETF, through your brokers on, on, on a stock exchange, you can have access to the fixed income, which then provides passive uh, income component. But I think overall, one of the benefits of ETFs really is it gave Australian investors access to international equity international shares because really if you think prior to ETFs you wanted to access shares that are listed say in Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange or other markets you really had to get a broker who has access to the securities and the cost would be very expensive and at times you're subject to foreign tax you know obligations and currency movements and currency so. movements etc yeah. but by accessing those ETFs domestically mm. it just provides that easily but what we see from the data that we have is that Australians are still underrepresented in the domestic in, in international equity there's a lot of domestic buyers in terms of people just tend to invest in in in, in home equity or shares that are domiciled here pretty much under exposed to international equity but the opportunity is that there there's quite a lot of ETFs and off at the moment that provide exposure to international shares the other thing to bear in mind as well is we are late adopters in Australia, right? Mm. Other markets are a lot mature and, and there's lessons to be learned from other markets. So we've got the benefit of looking of hindsight effectively by looking at other markets in the Northern Hemisphere and see what they've done. And really, statistically, if you look at the US, things that happened in the US 15 years ago probably are happening today. Mm. So if we look at the data in the US and study that, I think he can help us here. And, and the other thing as well is the, the Canadian market. It's very similar to Australia. So I've been kind of paying a lot of attention to the Canadian mm-hmm. market just to look at the trend and the trajectory that the Canadian market has taken is very similar to the trajectory that Australian market is currently going through. So we have an advantage of being a late mover in, in this. In this uh, is that, is that so case. to avoid mistakes or to... Yeah, it's just or, the pitfalls and also kind of provide you know, an opportunity for issuers to see how they can market their products better. Mm -hmm. Streamlining processes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about your job. Yeah, so my (laughs) job... Because this is what we actually started talking about (laughs) at that that launch party. We won't call it a party. (laughs) Uh, Networking event. Networking event. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Look, my role is obviously our core services is registry services. So we provide Mm. all the services that I mentioned earlier. Right, we manage the registry of ETF investors. We are the market leaders in that space. So, eighty percent of all ETF investors in the Australian market reside in our books. Our clients, our fund managers, our issuers in our books uh, are the market leaders. So, they have the lion's share of the market, effectively. Mm-hmm. And we have coverage of all asset classes on issue here in Australia. So, we've got a pretty big advantage in that space. So we provide all those shared registry services. It's like breathing for us. It just happens. We yep. do that really well. Mm-hmm. But what we've been doing well, without kind of tooting my own horn, is that we are trying to take advantage of our market leadership, especially with the data that we have in our database, to make sure that we help the industry. And by that, I mean the issuers and the investors. So the issuers are the, like the, the vanguards and the beta shares. Product managers. The product, you know, the ones yeah. issuing the yeah. ETFs. The fund managers. Yeah. yeah, the fund managers. Maybe I should use fund managers as a term there. <laughs> so if I take one step back and look at the market structures, right? Our market structure here is very unique in a good way, right? So if you look at the other markets in the Northern Hemisphere, US, Europe, to some extent Asia, the way the registers work or the records on the register in those markets they're intermediated, right? So on the register, you'd hardly find name on register. 
there'll mm. be an intermediary, either a broker, as is the case in the US. There are some direct investment registrations in the US, but it's a very small proportion of holders. The majority will sit under brokers. Because we're, we're very unique in Australia, yeah. aren't we, in terms yeah. of the, the structure of how Correct. Um, equities and shares yeah. and ETFs are, um, are held. Yep. Mm. In Europe, it's custodians, and, mm-hmm. and, and, some, and some of the Asian markets mirror the US market. Mm. In Australia, as, you, as you've rightly pointed out, you actually have a name on register. The mm. end investor sits on the register, mm. the majority of the records. So what does that mean, right, if you're an issuer? That means you know exactly who's investing in your product, mm. right? And who sits in the middle, right? Computer share. So computer share is the conduit between that end investor. And so you've got a large, a large amount of data yeah. to share, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. No. As I said, 80% of all investors sit now registered. So what we have done, we have just launched uh, to our clients. So it's not a market launch. To our clients, we have launched a very powerful ETF data insight tool that really tells them who is investing in terms of investor time? Is that mum and dad, retail holder, your listeners, mm. right? Is it a self-managed super fund? You know, is it an institution? And most importantly, what we're telling our issues is how are these investors then using your product? Is the asset utilization in line with the conventional wisdom, mm. with what you expect them to do? And the other thing that stands out for me is like we've got, it, you know, all in investors in our in our universe, the average ETF holding, so how many ETFs each one holds, is about 1.6, mm. right? Once you take out the institution investors, it's one. So the majority of ETF investors only have one. Now, mind you, we manage over 100 ETFs mm. across almost all asset, cl- all asset classes in issue in Australia, period. Yeah, yeah. But so the average the, investor is one ETF. Has one ETF. Yeah. Wow. So... It better, you know, be, a good, there's better a lot, be a good one. <laughs> there's a lot of conclusions to be made of that. I mean, so mm. there's a lot of potential for issuers to really educate the investors so that investors can actually kind of take advantage of this product. Mm. So we are playing a very critical role here in trying to bridge that gap because mm. really, if you think about it, we communicate to ETF issuers on our rage, investors, sorry, on our rage about six to seven times a year. So mm. there's an opportunity for us to really kind of be that messenger that pass on the information from one to the other mm. to make sure the size of the pie grows. Because unashamedly, you know, we want our the fund managers, our issuers to grow their book. Mm-hmm. But in doing that, we want the investors to also grow their wealth. Mm. So it's a win-win-win situation. So that's really kind of what we want to do. The other segment that is worth mentioning is self-managed super fund, right? Data doesn't lie, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the self-managed super fund as a segment, there's about a trillion dollars, Australian dollars sitting there, right? Mm-hmm. Today, I think the asset under management of ETFs was, is what? It's about a one in 129 billion. Mm-hmm. In our books... It only seems last week it was 100 billion. It got that magic it was 100 billion. 50, actually, not long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember going to an event, a $50 billion event, not long ago. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty... A significant milestone. So if you look at how many, you know, the percentage of self-managed super fund based on assets in the ETF in our universe, is less than 5%. Mm. And if, if you think so about it. So hang on, that number is less than 5% of, of the assets. Yeah. Of assets in super self-managed super funds or? The, less than 5% of ETF assets are from super, are invested in super, oh, self-managed super fund, mm-hmm. to be precise. And to me, when I look at self-managed super funds without being biased, yeah. I think ETFs is tailor-made for them, right? Low mm-hmm. costs, large exposures, no-brainer, right? Mm-hmm. But the challenge for ETF issues, as it is for retail investors, is that you know, it's a very uh, fragmented market. So what can we do then to kind of give issues the access to this for them to actually dip into that trillion yeah. dollars that is mm-hmm. in there? So there's a fair bit of work to be done, but I think on the bright side, there is a great opportunity, I think, for ETF issuers to get into that space and also opportunity for self-managed super funds to kind of get into the ETFs because really there's a lot of choices there, as we mentioned throughout the, mm. this podcast. There's quite a lot, a lot of choices for them. So I think it was important to, to kind of mention that. And also the other thing that's worth mentioning as well is that the retail investment in ETFs just grown exponentially, you mm. know? And I'm sure you would probably notice that, but it, it's really great. And, you know, when you look at Europe as an example, we had a 
head start to Australia at the moment, you know, you, the retail is investment is around 20%. Mm. In Australia, depending on the metric you want to use, if you look at the assets or on, in terms of number of holders or mum and dads who have come into the, the ETFs in the last two years, that is more than double, mm. right? Uh, smaller parcels, obviously, so they spend between a thousand and five thousand in, in, in investing. But that also is because there's been quite a lot of um, retail investment platforms mm. that have come to market that are assisting, you know, investors in investing in. Yeah, these. and so many small brokerages and so forth yeah. that are encouraging long-term, no-brainer investing by yeah. using ETFs as the core yeah. of um, the investment strategies. Yeah. 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 So that that has been really helpful. What <laughs> what we see from the data in terms of new holders coming in. It's, uh, yeah, it's a bit interesting because what you see, one of the pitfalls that you see as well is you, an investor who already holds single stock ETFs will jump on into an ETF. Mm. They will invest in an index ETF, for example, that already holds the shares they already have. Oh, right. So yeah. all of a sudden they become overweight in mm-hmm. those shares and they don't do their due diligence and rebalance their portfolio. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that uh, yeah, that can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, and that's really important. And uh, fortunately, there's portfolio tracking tools these days, yeah. which will show this. And yeah. you know, we've had people from those organisations yeah. on this podcast to talk about that. And so, yeah. just make sure you're not over what you know. You're not correlating too much between <laughs> your investments. It's the, very yeah, yeah. It's yeah. basic stuff, but yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah, the industry is heading the right direction. So mm. yeah, that's a long-winded way of answering your question. What I do. For but day to day, so yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. As I said at the top of the call, is my, my day to day is dealing with people at the front office of ETFs mm-hmm. and trying to find what their problems are, so that I can resolve it. And yeah. I think data insight is is a key aspect in that, really, because data doesn't lie. Mm. Um, I just also, just before we finish off, I just wanted to just one thing that I just wanted to talk about in share registry services and in ETFs. And this is boring, I know. Yeah. I know people, this is really boring, but I think it's very, it's amazing that at the end of every financial year, your ETF provider will issue a statement showing you exactly the tax implications of what. Um, what your holding means, which you can just give to your accountant. Is it, can you just describe that piece of paper for me? I mean, I, I'm just giving you an overview. I don't even know what the correct technical term is for that. Yeah, so the, the correct technical statement will be an AMA tax statement. Mm-hmm. It, it is just a tax statement. So ETFs pay distributions. So they, for lack of a better term, they're like dividends. Mm-hmm. I think you're, a lot of your listeners will be familiar with dividends. Yeah. Uh, they pay distributions, which really is... You know, if you invest in ETF, all the income and uh, capital gains from the underlying securities are distributed to to unit holders, the ETF holders. And at the end of the year, those are kind of calculated, and the ta- and, and and a tax statement is produced. And some of them have franking credits. Yep. and Some have got uh, international implica- taxation implications, yep. and all of those things are all summarised in this document, yep. aren't they? Yeah. So the income will have all the components that are. In there, whether you're talking about you know domestic imputation credits or foreign imputation credits, if relevant, yeah, yeah. capital gains and so on. So that information is calculated. And these days, because we we actually send that information electronically to the tax office. So if investors are doing, they're kind of going to the ATO and doing self service tax return return themselves. You know, mm. that information is already fed to the ATO, so they don't need to actually print a piece of paper. And refer to it, right? Those you know statements are mailed or emailed to them for for uh, reference purposes, but they don't really need it because these days everything is sent to the ATO electronically. So when investors file their tax return, the ATO already has that. It's auto filled yeah. in, in there, isn't there? Yeah. Yes, and you're doing if you're doing a pre fill, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. that information is already there. Um, so yeah, it's it's fairly automated, and ATO has done a lot of progress in data matching. So the days of you printing your dividend advisors and filing them and at the end of the year giving them to your tax accountant Mm -hmm. are long gone these days. Yeah. Mm. Ibrahim, thank you very much for joining me today. Phil, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. 
Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast.